This edition of To The Point is from June 1977. I'm Phil Constantine, and I helped start a program called To The Point at Rice. It was a 15-minute interview program, which was distributed around the state of Texas. The guest this time is Dr. Alex Dessler. He served three terms as the chairman of the Department of Space Physics and Astronomy, and he helped found the world's first university department of space science at Rice University. He held positions uh, for the director of Space Science Laboratory at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. He was president of the University Space Sciences Association, numerous other awards and citations. And in this program, we're going to be talking about space, colonies, and energy. The prophets of doom say we will run out of energy and land for the ever-growing masses of people on this planet by the year 2000. Will orbital satellites, orbital colonies be a possible solution to this problem? We'll find out. To the Point, presented by Rice University. I'm Phil Constantine. We're talking with Dr. Alex Dessler, who is Professor of Space Physics and Astronomy at Rice University. Dr. Dessler, how important actually is uh, energy with us right now? Are we really in that grave of a situation? For a technological society such as ours, energy is really the, the whole game. That uh, When we, uh, the Industrial Revolution started, uh, we started using other sources of energy other than beasts of burden, horses, uh, mm -hmm. manpower. Manpower literally started mining coal and developing the capability of man beyond an individual worker, way beyond anything he could do by himself or with the aid of a couple animals. And until recently, that energy, water power, coal, gas, oil, has been essentially free has never been considered a factor in production, yet it's the whole thing for a technological society. We are a small step away where you could imagine the following, a completely automated factory that, say, makes television sets mm -hmm. or radios. Let's, let's use radios for this example. Oh, it makes radios. Uh, what you do is you bring in old radios or brought in and put into the factory. Uh, it then, completely automated, computer controlled, takes the old radios apart, melts down, takes all the components apart, mm -hmm. melts them down, puts them back together, then manufactures new components, assembles them, tests them, and out the back door comes new radios, in the front door is coming the old radios. So we need no new raw materials, we need no workers, all that's added to the factory is energy. Mm -hmm. Energy is the only component. We can make cars that way, TV sets, almost everything. And for most production, energy is the whole thing. For our farming now, you got to an enormous wheat field of wheat or corn. There are two or three workers handling the whole thing. It could just as well be done by computer control with essentially no workers. And the only thing, the only component you would add to this enormous farming enterprise is energy. Energy in the form of fuel to run the machinery energy in the form of fertilizer to get good yield from the crops, energy to pump water for irrigation during mm -hmm. drought periods. So for a highly technological society, energy we're a small step from energy being the ho only significant factor of production. When, we, when energy becomes expensive or we can't get it, our society is not only going to stop growing, but is going to go into some sort of a de depression of a sort that we've never experienced before. Likewise, the Earth is getting within a factor of, say, 10 uh, of the maximum it can hold without serious pollution problems. People themselves are right. pollution problems. Uh, you can lick pollution with energy. You can make fresh water with energy if you need to do that, mm -hmm. uh, like taking the salt out of seawater. All that requires is lots of energy, and you can have fresh water. Uh, to have people live well, move around. Again. We, well, we have actually had some desalinization stations here in Texas on the Gulf Coast that were closed down because the energy to produce the steam that was necessary to heat the water, or to heat the water, to make the steam, which was to get the salt out, it just got to the point where the energy cost too much to do it. Mm -hmm. So that was the situation. So. Yeah. 
somewhat to the original point is that uh, even now, uh, President Carter has said that we should approach the energy problem as if it were a war situation, as if this, the survival actually of the entire country, if not the world, is on this problem. And uh, part of the work you do through an organization called the L5 Society is looking into the feasibility of building orbital space colonies, not only to house people, but to get in uh, solar collectors. And uh, did you explain the concept of what a solar collector, how it could collect the sun's energy mm -hmm. and benefit the Earth? Okay, the leading idea, and there are several alternates, but the leading idea is to put up a large area of solar cells, and this is many square miles, like the present prototype is an area of solar cells, uh, three by 15 miles, three miles on one side, 15 miles on the other, a, a fraction of the area of the city of Houston mm -hmm. in orbit, uh, converting the electrical energy that's captured from the solar, the sunlight, falls in the solar cells, which then converts to energy, then this energy is converted to microwave energy with great efficiency, and uh, this energy then is beamed to collectors and the Earth's surface that could be placed close to cities. Mm -hmm. Or uh, exactly how does this work? Uh, okay. You know. The microwave energy is just like um, TV signals or radar signals that are with us all the time, like radar mm -hmm. uh, beams come through the atmosphere all the time, uh, every day. I mean, we, we live with them all the time. Now, these would be more intense, but not intense enough to be dangerous to mm -hmm. animals. In other words, it wouldn't be like if an airplane had to be flying through. Or a bird or a Right, it wouldn't cook it like animal. a microwave oven. It would not be as, as hot as a microwave oven. And essentially, I guess the feasibility of this is that... Uh, they're, you know, they're talking about having solar collectors here on the Earth's surfaces, like mm -hmm. in Arizona places. But, yeah. you know, uh, why we say Arizona, for one fact, is because that there's, you know, less clouds mm -hmm. out in Arizona on a regular basis. But the problem is you've got 12 hours of nighttime. Right. Where, so that's the situation yeah. in space. You don't have the nighttime. It's still the trade-off between doing it on the Earth's surface and space still has to be evaluated. You would need roughly to trade off for cloudy days and uh, late afternoon, early morning where the sun shines at an angle, mm -hmm. plus the nighttime when the sun doesn't shine at all. You need about 10 times the area on the Earth's surface as you do in space. Then the power is uh, not continuous. You, as I said, we lose it at night. So you need some method of storing. Uh, one suggestion for the Earth's surface is to say convert water into hydrogen, uh, take water apart, get hydrogen and oxygen. Mm -hmm and then store the uh, hydrogen in big big tanks and then use it to uh, burn like we do now natural gas right. to make power but these two systems ought to be competing uh, i believe with each other in studies to see which is really the best because what we're talking about for power are one solar power satellite with enough power to run the entire city of Houston all the time, 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. uh, what would it take on the Earth's surface to do that? It would take a facility costing billions of facilities, not one facility, but facilities costing billions and billions of dollars. Uh, how expensive is the space system really going to be? There's a lot of clever things that can be done. Some ideas have not, I'm sure, have not been thought of yet mm -hmm. that will lower the cost further. So what we need to do is to study doing it one way versus doing it another in a competitive atmosphere to see ultimately what's the best, uh, what the best solution will be. But I guess the real be. point is that the uh, technology is already there. That's right. It can be done now if NASA or the government or private industry, whatever, decides that they want to do it. Uh, I know that uh, members of the L5 Society, which is... Uh, which you might explain what exactly mm -hmm. the L5 Society is, but I know they've been talking with business people and banks and this kind of thing, and they mm -hmm. have uh, become very interested in the idea and believe it might be able to be feasible uh, not only financial, uh, not only technically, but financially yeah. is a good idea. Yeah. We're getting close to the point where it looks as though the power in space will be clearly financially superior. Power from space will be clearly financially superior to an investment of power from from a power plant on the Earth's surface. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other reasons for going into space, but let's just stick to the power for now on because, uh, as I said the, at the beginning of the program, that if we don't have it, 
we're finished as a technological society. There's no way we can survive as the kind of society we've developed. I'm not without. talking about uh, what you were talking about as a possibility in the future of the completely automated, but just staying with what we've got now. Just even, even holding our own. Right. Because we put so much energy into agriculture. Mm -hmm. We couldn't grow a tenth the food we grow now without pouring in just millions and millions of barrels of oil mm -hmm. a day. Okay. The L5 Society is dedicated to the proposition that building orbital colonies can bring benefits such as cheap solar power to the Earth. I might make an aside here what some of the other benefits are. Uh, the idea appears perfectly feasible to build large colonies in space that would um, house a single space structure, would hold, would form the basis for a colony of perhaps a million people, the almost the size of the city, of the population of Houston mm -hmm. in orbit around the Earth. These people would work at things like power generation or mining the moon of raw materials, rare minerals, or minerals that are in short supply in right. the Earth, and uh, sending either power back to Earth by the microwave link I mentioned, or sending uh, minerals that are rare enough. To also, they could do things like, uh, uh, just a, one small example, like they can make ball bearings better in, in a vacuum or in that particular kind of lack of gravity than they can on Earth. So a lot of the things that they try very hard to duplicate on Earth facilities would be very easy to be done in outer space. Yes, uh, I don't know about that particular example, but uh, I'm sure there will be things that either low G or zero G will be superior uh, for manufacture um, in, in space and that they will do them and it'll, they'll pr provide an economic justification. Then there's another one that's often brought up um, that is emotionally appealing. It's an emotionally appealing argument. It's uh, an adventure. It's fun. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, it disperses mankind. These will be self-sustaining colonies that do not need the Earth anymore to exist and even duplicate the colonies. They can mine the moon to get more raw materials to build other colonies. If some calamity should befall the Earth, uh, some uh, great war, uh, some biological experimentation that runs mm -hmm. amok, then the race of mankind will survive in these colonies and expand through the solar system and eventually uh, through the rest of the um, um, galaxy. Well, you know, it all sounds very well and good, but uh, how far away is this? Uh, is this Buck Rogers, or is this the uh, next few years? Well, we could get started on a low-altitude space colony of some sort, a large space station, rather soon, as soon as the shuttle becomes operational, which is only now le uh, less than three years away. But there no the planning really isn't moving fast enough, is not far enough advanced that we will start that soon. So I would imagine being realistic that we're talking about getting started in earnest perhaps five years from now, maybe mm -hmm. a little less, and have something reasonable in orbit ten years from now. But then it could go very fast. We so could in ten years there could be people living permanently in outer that's space. Right. As, as little as ten years. But this would require that we start in earnest. Remember the Apollo program. It was mm -hmm. the really and I think in many people's mind, the most difficult technological achievement that uh, mankind has ever carried off. And uh, we did the whole thing from zero to landing on the moon and bringing them back in less than 10 years. And I think something like a space colony, we're better equipped to do now than we were the Apollo at that time. Even though it's larger, it's not that much larger. And uh, let's say we know more. The point is we don't have to develop the new technology as you go along. And the management techniques. We know mm -hmm. how to manage a big program like that. And the knowledge of how to carry out a big program like that without bankrupting the nation is now at our disposal. Mm -hmm. So that's, it, in other words, it is a very feasible system. Are there books and materials where people can find out more about these yeah. ideas? Let me recommend an excellent, excellent book. Um, it's called Colonies in Space. Uh, the author is T.A. Heppenheimer. Uh, and it's yeah. published by Stackpole Books. And it's a very easy to read book with profusely illustrated. And then there's also the L5 Society that 
uh, I would recommend anyone interested in this uh, join. You can join the National Society by writing the L5 Society, 1620 North Park Avenue, Tucson, Arizona, 85719. And they can get more information about that. Joining, and L5 is a position in space where you, would, where you could put one of these massive colonies. We've been talking with Dr. Alex Dessler, who's Professor of Space Physics and Astronomy, and I'm Phil Constantine. Thank you very much for listening. To the Point is produced by the Rice University Information Office at the studios of Rice Radio, KTRU, in Houston.